Welcome to School Report, a glimpse into the classrooms of St. Lucie County Public Schools. School Report provides the opportunity to share with the community academic and extracurricular activities of students in our schools. And now, here is School Report.
I'd like to give many thanks to Roy Brewer. Without Roy, you would not have been able to meet Woody. So, Roy, would you please stand? I'd like to thank our Gold Star Committee that has made this all possible for us to educate the children of Northport about the Gold Star and everything that that entails. I would like to thank Karen Zook and Linda Schumann, who are Gold Star mothers. They have brought so much feeling to this school through their teaching, through their efforts, through their lessons. The they, they've really gone to town on it. So thank you, teachers. Thank you, Nick Carey. And thank you, Georgia. <laughs> Many thanks a thousand times, a thousand times over to Woody Herschel Williams for coming to school. Thank you. I can't tell you how much it means to us all, every one of us. Every middle school student here at Northport K through 8 school has read his biography, The Caretaker. Every single student. Every single student knows who Woody is. Every single student has made a poster or a picture dedicated to Woody. The program at Northport. The Veteran Partners in Education started in 2006. It's been going strong ever since. It started with Roy, Mr. Brewer, with Bill Arnold, with Peter Papalizio, Ray Carter, and several others. We, we, we helped build the Purple Heart Memorial in Veterans Park. A couple of those guys have passed away, and it, and it hurts our heart to know that we have to keep pushing on, and things are happening to our, genera our older generation, and we have to keep working forward. This year, we partnered with the Vietnam Veterans Chapter 566, the Mike Bradley unit. We, we partnered with the United Veterans and with the Gold Star Committee, along with Karen Zook and Linda Schumann, to educate kids about sacrifice and about the most important thing, integrity. Why did World War II start? <clears throat> Before we can really, truly appreciate Woody, and his service. We have to know a little bit about the background, what was happening at the time. Germany lost in a heavy defeat in World War I, which was the, from 1914 to 1918. Germany was desperate. They had millions and millions to pay in reparations because they lost the war. They could have no standing military. And along comes a very charismatic guy that made the people of Germany feel like they were special, feel like they were really something. And that guy's name was, anybody want to tell me? Adolf Hitler. That's correct. We know that. Hitler wanted a strong Aryan or white race of people to take over all of Europe, all of Russia, and then the world. Germany invaded Poland in 1939, and this started World War II. The United States became involved in the war in December 7, 1941, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. We could sit back no longer. We had to get involved. Our president was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who led the United States of America in a war while he was in a wheelchair. He was paralyzed. World War II was the beginning of great change in our culture here in America. Overwhelming nationalism, and patriotism, what you guys display in the school, everyone felt. Everyone wanted to be part of the, to be American, to be part of something, something greater than themselves. There was no division. Everyone felt that, and they wanted to help. Women left their homes en masse for the first time ever, boys and girls, for the first time ever. The women weren't housekeepers. They had to go out and go to work in the factories because where were the men? They joined the war effort, right? It was a world war. Many firsts happened during World War II because that everybody wanted to help. Many first things. And one of those things was the Tuskegee Airmen, the very first African-American group of fighter pilots, very first time. Very first time, the WASPs, the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, women actually became pilots in the war. The WACs, first women to serve in the Women's Army Corps. It's a time of great change in our country. 
and the people were solid. There was two sides of World War II, boys and girls, and adults, just to refresh your memory. There was the axis of evil, and there was the Allies. Germany was led by Adolf Hitler. He was an axis power. Italy was led by Benito Mussolini, and Japan was led by Hirohito. The Allies on the other side, the good guys, were United States of America, led by FDR, Great Britain, led by Winston Churchill, and a friend, an ally but not a friend, Joseph Stalin in Russia. When you're learning about World War II, like I did, I wasn't a very good math student, so what I did was, I tried to think, what am I good at? What am I good at? I'm good at reading, so I read and read and read. Well, what I really liked was American history, right? And American history is like a spider web. You start in the middle, and once you start detective work, and you start investigating, right, more interesting things happen, and more interesting things happen, and more inter interesting things happen, and you become involved in American history. That's what happened to me. But when you hear words like Holocaust, D-Day, Normandy Beach, Japanese internment camps, Battle of Midway, Tuskegee Airmen, and Iwo Jima. These are words that can start the wheels turning in your mind. So when you watch the program today, everything that you're going to learn about World War II, everything that you're going to learn about Medal of Honor, everything that you're going to learn about Gold Star, which we already know all that, that's where you find those one or two or three key things that stick out in your mind and then like a squirrel, you go and you look and you research and you Google and you look more. And the further you go, the more you find out. That's right. All right, now we're at the Battle of Iwo Jima. This is where we meet Woody. February 19th to March 26, 1945, thousands and thousands of Marines landed on a porous volcanic island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. They were going to take that island back. It was called Operation Detachment. The, Woody is the only living Medal of Honor recipient from Iwo Jima. He is only one of seven living Medal of Honor recipients from all of World War II. The, United, the Medal of Honor is the United States' highest military honor. It can only be awarded by the President of the United States through an act of Congress. The President will take that award and put it around the recipient's neck. It is for acts above and beyond. It is for acts of valor that put beyond the call of duty, putting yourself at risk to save the lives of many. So that's what I'm going to tell you about World War II, just to refresh your memory, just to get you activated. Now what we're going to do is we're going to have some student teachers our kids, some of our kids have learned many, many lessons about World War II. And this is just, they want to do some kid teaching. They want to show you what they've learned. Okay? So first of all, we're going to have Miss Georgia Stone, sixth grade history class. All right? Who can tell me, and remember, boys and girls, loud, clear, and slow. When was World War II? Nice and loud. World War II started and ended from 1939 to 1945. 1939 to 1945. Very good. Thank you. Now, let's talk about who was in the war. Who were the Axis countries? Germany. Nice and loud. Bring it up. Who else was an Axis country? Japan. Who else was an Axis country? Italy. Turn it around. Turn it around. <laughs> Who was the leader? Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill. Who was the leader? 
Mussolini. Mussolini. What country? Italy. Italy. Who were the? Who was another leader of the Axis? Hirohito from Japan. Yes, Hirohito from Japan. Who else was the leader of an Axis country? Hitler from Germany. Hitler from Germany. That's right. Let's get those up there so we can see. How about the Allied countries? Allied. Churchill, he's from Great Britain. Yes, he is. Churchill from Great Britain. Who else is an uh, ally? Stalin from Russia. Stalin from Russia. Who else? FDR from the United States. Who else? Truman from the United States. Good job. Why was why is Truman added there? Because anybody want to tell me? He was the one that signed the paper to um, release the war. The war. Yes, she enriched herself. He was the one that signed the paper at the very end of the war. FDR took us all through the war. But then we had Truman signing the papers and wrapping up the war. That's right. Okay, why did World War II take place? Why? After World War I, 1914 to 1918, Germany was a decimated country. Adolf Hitler became a charismatic leader. He wanted to take over all of Europe and the world. In 1939, Germany, Germany invaded Poland. That's right. Okay, so now we're going to hear a, have a timeline. We're going to have a timeline of some things that happened during World War II. You ready, guys? Come on out. <coughs> it's really important that we know what happened, and in kind of some order, right? That we have to know what happened during World War II. World War II was an exciting, crazy time. It's the greatest generation of American people came out of World War II. So we need to know about this to be educated, filled up people, right? Okay, so stand up straight, guys. Pull it out. You ready? Okay, here we go. All right, guys, come on. Come on. September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland. World War II begins. On December 7th, 1941, Japan attacks Pearl Harbor. February 9th, 1942, FDR signed the Executive Order 9066, which leads to Japanese Americans being sent to internment camps. On May 1942, the first Russian cars is sent May 1942, WAX is created, Women's Army Auxiliary Corps is created. June 2nd, 1942, Tuskegee Airmen undertake their first combat mission. June 4th to the 7th, 1942, Battle of the Midway. American Navy beats Japan and North Africa is invaded. June 6, 1944, D-Day at Normandy, France. December 16, 1944, Battle of the Bulge takes place. January 26, 1945, Soviet troops liberate Auschwitz death camp. February 21st, 1945, Marines raised flag at Mount Sabachi during the Battle for Iwo Jima. May 8th, 1945, BE Day, Victory in Europe. August 16, 1945, Jewish Shops first come bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. September 2nd, 1945, Japan signs the surrender treaty. Good. Very good. I mean, yeah. 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 Our students got a lot of their information from this book. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The song is entitled. Let's 
or three ideas or words that intrigue you and I want you to take away today and I want you to go home and I want you to investigate those words. Become a World War II detective. So I want you to sit back, I want you to enjoy the PowerPoint, 10 minutes or so, and then we are going to talk to Woody, our, our, our fabulous guy. Remember everything I talked about. World War II lasted from September 1, 1939 to September 2, 1945. The U.S. had provided aid to Britain and the Soviet Union, but did not enter the war until Congress declared war on Japan and entered the war after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941. Japan intended to dominate Asia and the Pacific and was already at war with China in 1937. But the World War is generally said to have begun on September 1, 1939, when Germany invaded Poland and France, and Britain declared war on Germany. Germany conquered or controlled much of continental Europe and formed the Axis alliance with Italy and Japan. Nazi leader Adolf Hitler was one of the most powerful and infamous dictators of the 20th century. He took control of the German government in 1933, his establishment of concentration camps to enslave Jews and other groups he believed to be a threat to Aryan supremacy resulted in the death of more than six million people in the Holocaust. The Nazi attack on Poland in 1939 started World War II, and by 1941, Germany occupied much of Europe and North Africa. It was clear that Hitler's motive was world domination. The Holocaust began in 1933 when Adolf Hitler came to power in Germany and ended in 1945 when the Nazis were defeated by the Allied powers. The Holocaust refers to the Nazis' persecution and planned slaughter of the Jewish people. The Nazis used the term, the final solution, to refer to their plan to murder the Jewish people. The prisoners were held in concentration camps run by the Nazis. The term concentration camp refers to a camp in which people are detained or confined, usually under harsh conditions and without regard to legal norms of arrest and imprisonment. It is estimated that 11 million people were killed during the Holocaust. Six million of these were Jews. Thank <laughs> you. 
Someone in town must have told them we were coming. Yeah, I think so. Will you ask him, uh, ask him what kind of camp this is? Um, what, um, why are they here? Was ist das hier? Arbeitslager für, 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 für Unerwünschte, wirklich. In June 1941, the European Axis powers launched an invasion of the Soviet Union, opening the largest land theater of war in history. It was the most widespread war in history and directly involved more than 100 million people from over 30 countries, from Europe, Pacific, Atlantic, Southeast Asia, China, the Middle East, the Mediterranean, and Northern Africa. In December 1941, Japan attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii and in European territories in the Pacific Ocean. Then, it quickly conquered much of the Western Pacific. This attack led to the United States officially entering the war. all of its regional losses and assaulted Germany and its associates. During 1944 and 1945, the Japanese suffered major reverses in Central Asia and its navy was debilitated. The Battle of Iwo Jima was a major battle in which the U.S. Marines landed on and eventually seized the island of Iwo Jima from the Japanese 
during World War II. The American invasion, labeled Operation Detachment, had the objective of apprehending the entire island, including the three Japanese-controlled airfields, in order to provide a staging area for attacks on the Japanese main islands. The five-week battle encompassed some of the severest and bloodiest hostilities of the war in the Pacific of World War II. Raising the Flag on Iwo Jima is a historic photograph taken on February 23, 1945 by Joe Rosenthal. It depicts five United States Marines and a United States Navy hospital corpsman raising a U.S. flag atop Mount Suribachi during the Battle of Iwo Jima in World War II. The war in Europe ended with an invasion of Germany by the Western Allies and the Soviet Union culminating in the capture of Berlin by Soviet and Polish troops and the subsequent German unconditional surrender on May 8, 1945. After a series of defeats in the East, Italy surrendered. Hitler killed himself shortly before Germany's defeat. The United States dropped atomic bombs on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August 6 and August 9, 1945. These attacks were pertinent to the ending of World War II. There were an estimated 50 million to 85 million fatalities. These made World War II the deadliest conflict in human history. If tomorrow all the things were gone, I'd work for all my life. And I had to start again with just my children and my wife. I thank my lucky stars to be living here today. Cause the flag still stands for freedom And they can't take that away And I'm proud to be an American Well at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the men who died Who gave that right to me And I gladly stand up next to you And defend her there ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the USA Now as we went for it, now in the video game, I had never heard the term Medal of Honor. Even the day that I received it, I had no idea of the impact it was going to have on my life. I get to heaven, one of my first questions to God is going to be, why me? There's a guy died right beside me. Why did he go and I didn't? I don't have any answer for that. No. And maybe there is no answer. I don't know. Just to be put in this position is just... For a country boy, unbelievable. talking about and going over the announcements about and drawing about the person who is a Medal of Honor recipient. If we're in rare air people, we might not ever meet a Medal of Honor recipient ever again in our lives. He's a primary source for you children that you might not ever, ever get the opportunity to meet again. Woody.
my wife has said, sometime in the past, he's never speechless. But he's awful close right now. I don't have words in my vocabulary to adequately express how I feel at this moment. I've been to a lot of gatherings in my life, <clears throat> but I don't believe I have ever attended a more <clears throat> concise educational piece of information about World War II in a school. And I want to congratulate all of you students who took a part, all the teachers and the leaders who made it possible. Thank you for that education because we must not ever forget. I have said many times from the day after I received this medal that I so proudly wear around my neck that I am just the caretaker. And I say that because others gave their lives protecting me that made it possible for me to be recommended for the medal. Had my commanding officer and fellow Marines not considered me worthy because of the action on February the 23rd, 1945, to wear the highest medal that our country can bestow upon an individual, had they not considered me worthy and be willing to testify as to what took place that day, I would not have ever received another honor. We are sure that there are many, many cases where an individual did perform above and beyond what was normally expected of that individual at the moment and would, been, would have been in a position to receive our nation's highest award. But there was no officer who survived that was able to make the recommendation, which is one of the requirements for receiving the Medal of Honor. An enlisted man, an enlisted person, cannot make that recommendation. It must come from an officer. And secondly, going all the way back to biblical times, there must be at least two witnesses that are willing to testify, sign something that says they too agree with what the officer has stated and with his recommendation. So when I wear this medal, I wear it in honor of those Marines, particularly those two, I have no idea as to their name. I know without a doubt they had loved ones. But I wear this medal in their honor, not mine. They sacrificed so much more than I did.
You know, my, my name is a very common one. Herschel Woodrow Williams. I was the 11th of 11, the last to get here. And those 11 before me in my family had no doctor. All of them were attended by a neighbor, usually a mother herself. The doctor finally arrived at my home three days after I was born because they were not quite sure I was going to make it. And we were a long ways out of town and doctors very seldom ever came that distance. But they asked him to come to check me out and apparently to see if I was going to survive. I did, as you know. <laughs> His name was Herschel. His first name was Herschel, spelled the same way mine is, without the C. Apparently his mother couldn't spell either. <laughs> and then they named me, and gave me a middle name of Woodrow. I have no idea why my dad thought Woodrow Wilson was a great person, but I guess he thought that'd be a good name for his boy, and so I ended up Woodrow, which ends up Wood. Naturally, I'm a Williams. And I was a Williams because my daddy was a Williams. I was born in America because my family lived in America. I'm a West Virginian because my family were West Virginians. I am a Methodist because I married a Methodist angel. <laughs> when I was getting ready to go into the Marine Corps, I wanted to go at 17 years of age. My mother, my father had deceased. My mother would not sign my paper. She was trying to run a dairy farm and she felt she needed me on the farm and they needed me wherever I would go. At that point in time, I had never heard of the Japanese. I didn't know such people existed. In fact, I didn't even know we had a South Pacific Ocean. That's how smart I was. <laughs> I think I did know, somewhere in my learning and the teaching of my teachers, that we had an Atlantic. But that was because there was some kind of a ship in sunk. Uh, and I think I knew that. I think I knew we had an uh, Atlantic Ocean. But when I first tried to go into the Marine Corps, and I don't have any real reason for wanting to be a Marine, except that within my community, country community, we had a couple fellows who did not like farm work, and they did not like coal mining, and there wasn't hardly anything else to do. So they said, to themselves, apparently, I'm going in the Marine Corps. And this was during the Depression years when no jobs were existing. And when they did, they had to sign their piece of paper saying, you got me for six years, Mr. Marine Corps. But they were required when they came home one time a year, they were required to wear their dress boots. 
Marine Corps required that because they were still trying to bring the Marine Corps to the front. And that was good, good publicity as long as the guy behaved himself. But the thing that impressed me was he was always very neat, straight, tall, polite, and could get the girls. <laughs> So I guess from those, that influence, I thought, hey, if I ever go in the military, that's what I want to be. I want to be like him. I want to look like him. So I attempted to enlist at 18. Because my mother would not sign my paper at 17. And when I went into the Marine Corps and filled out my enlistment contract, handed it to the, to the sergeant, he just looked at me and stood in my paper and said, can't take you. And naturally I said, why? He said, you're too short. I was. I was five foot six. But you had to be five foot eight. So, I went back home. I'm going back to the farm. If I can't go to the Marine Corps, I'm not even going to go. Well, that was <laughs> dreaming. But then I reached my 19th birthday, and two weeks after my 19th birthday, I went back to enlist because the recruiter had looked me up saying they had taken that height requirement off of 5'8", so now they could take little squirts like me. And did I want to go? And I said, yes, I do. I still want to go and protect America. At that point in time in my life, I did not know that we would go to foreign islands, that we would even leave the United States, that I was going into the Marine Corps not to fight the Japanese, I've never heard of them, not to fight on some island in the South Pacific that I did not know existed. I went in the Marine Corps to protect my country and my freedom. Just basically personally daring anybody to try and come and take my country and our freedom away from us. It was quite a shock when after I graduated boot camp from California we were told you're going to the Pacific. But that's where the enemy was, and that's where we had to go. The Medal of Honor that I wear around my neck has a great deal of meaning. It is more than just a piece of metal. And you know that it is. Uh, made, manufactured by Lobia. The Navy and the Marine Corps and Coast Guard Medal is different than the Army Medal and the Air Force Medal. Our medal hangs from an anchor that has a lot of meaning. But when it was manufactured, the manufacturer used real soft copper to make the little rings that holds it to the anchor. And over the years, some of our recipients of the Navy Marine Corps Medal have lost their medal, their original, because those little rings separated as they walked. Some of us don't walk very gracefully. And they, they would jiggle and uh, sometimes you'd even run. And those little rings would separate. It would come off the anchor. Mine came off a number of times. I'd get me a pair of pliers and put it back together. But one day I walked in the house from a parade that I'd been in, and 
my wife said as I walked through the door, you're about to lose your medal. And it was, it was hanging cockeyed. It had come off one side of the anchor. I didn't know that. I could have lost it completely and not even know that. But I changed clothes, went out to the garage, got me a piece of 12 gauge electric wire, and I made me some new rings. And that has been 25 years ago, and they have never come off. I think somebody ought to tell the people who make these things, hey, 12 gauge wire works beautifully. But this metal has many meanings, and very definite meanings. It, it means humility. It is not something you go around bragging about. Because you must consider yourself a very unusual individual and certainly most honored to be wearing the most honored medal the country can offer. It means humility because, in most cases, many gave their lives, making it possible for every recipient to receive it. And it means commitment. When I went into the Marine Corps, as everybody who goes into the armed forces must, those who occupy our offices of authority, must raise their hand and take an oath. And that oath has got to mean something to each one of us when we do that. It isn't something that we should say without a great deal of thought and commitment. But I took an oath to serve America and to protect my and our Christian. Loyalty, it means loyalty because regardless of the circumstances, we must be loyal to each other. Otherwise, it's not going to work. We must be loyal to our America because of what she gives to us. Responsibility. The day after I received the medal, I was so frightened at the time President Truman placed her around my neck, I couldn't even think. I don't know whether any of you, maybe some of you, have experienced an occasion when something happened and after it happened, your body began shaking and you had no control over it for a period of moments. It's only happened twice in my life. The first time was when the president was placing this medal around my neck and my body would not be still. The second time I almost lost my life. And following that incident, my body again began quickly. But the Commandant of the Marine Corps the day after, standing in his office, my body was not shaking. But I was so frightened, standing before the commandant of the Marine Corps, a place that I never dreamed I would ever be. I was so frightened that my brain was limbo. Much of what he said to me I do not recall. But there's one thing that 
I do recall because the thought flashed through my mind. I could lose it. Because he said that metal does not belong to you. And then he continued to say, it belongs to all those Marines who did not get to come home. And don't ever do anything that would tarnish that metal. We have lost the word tarnish on our language. We don't use it much anymore. Finally, it means appreciation, which I've already expressed. But had my commanding officer and those four Marines who were witnesses on that day have not been willing to say to those above them, we believe his action would justify consideration and award of our nation's highest award. And as you saw in the PowerPoint, I've asked the question many times, why me? I went to school with a young boy, one year older than me, but we walked back and forth to school every day. Oh, I could say the snow got waist deep, but it was only deep, deep, really. But we did that for about seven years. So Leonard and I became reasonably good friends. He was taller than me, legs were longer than mine, his arms were longer than mine. I tried to whip him a few times and I always got the worst end of it. <laughs> but I wanted Leonard to go in the Marine Corps with me when I was going in and he said no, he wanted to go in the Air Force, the Army Air Force. So he went his way and I went mine. Our paths never crossed again. I never heard from Leonard or about him. Until after the war. Leonard had another brother that also was serving in the army. He never got overseas. The Thunder lost his life in a B-24, B-24 bomber. He was in the nose cone when it got hit. So Leonard never got to come back home. During World War II, as an educational piece for our students, we had a way in which we could tell that this home has somebody in the war. And then we also had a way that we could tell by this home they lost a loved one who's not coming home. I wish today that somebody more than me with whatever power it would take would somehow get this program back in effect, back in effect, so that we in the community, wherever we live, whether on the block or in a high rise, would have some way of knowing this family 
and somebody protected America and protected me. And we have no way today of doing that. We can have someone lost, even in the community, and never know that that person gave their life. But during World War II, when a person would go in the armed forces, every household would be given one of these. My mother had three of these hanging in her front window. Now up that told the individuals passing our country home was that household has three people in war serving our country. In my mother's case, all three of us got back home. Fortunately, my brother next to me, wounded severely in the Battle of the Bulge, maintained in the Army Hospital months after the war was over, finally got home in March 1946. He did not survive long afterwards. But Leonard's home, where two of these little star flags were in the window, one of those had to change. One of those had to turn gold. Because this gold star says, one in this household is not coming home. Wouldn't it be great if we had some way that we could distinguish that today so we would know, maybe participate, maybe be of service, maybe just let the folks know we care to remember. We're not going to forget. I've had so many miracles in my life. And they keep happening. Thank God for that. And the Gold Star Family Memorial Monument is one of those miracles. I'm going to close with this. For years, Gold Star Mothers were pretty well recognized nationally, and some states organized Gold Star Mothers organizations. West Virginia never did until about five, six years ago. But Gold Star Mothers were pretty well as an organization recognized. But yet, nationally, on a national level, our country had never done anything on a national level to recognize those mothers who lost part of herself when she gave a loved one in our armed forces. I thought we should have something in our District of Columbia where I'm told, I don't know whether it's Google or somebody else, that we have 1,100 monuments and memorials in the district, but not one that pays any honor or tribute to the mothers who gave a loved one. 
So I began a program, had an artist help me come up with a conception of what he and I thought would be appropriate for a memorial in Washington. Displaying a mother with a baby in her arm, the burial flag in her other arm, a small child standing beside her, an indication of our armed forces and that we must maintain an armed force to stay free. And we must have people on the other side supporting those people who are serving. I attempted several times to sell that to people with lots of money. We had a guy in West Virginia that sold a whole bunch of coal mines, multi-millionaire. I thought surely he would finance such a thing. And I believe he would. But West Virginia is the home of Mother's Day. Mother's Day started in West Virginia. Anna Marie Jarvis loved her mother, as we all do. And she wanted something in her community to pay tribute to her mother and to have a national Mother's Day. So she petitioned Congress and with the help of congressional people, we have Mother's Day. And she has a church name for her mother. She has a huge bust of her mother in front of the church. To the mother. And that's why we was able to get the first Cold Star Family Memorial Monument in the Donald C. Bernard Cemetery in East West Virginia. But we did it a little selfishly, I have to admit, because on the Capitol grounds of our Capitol, we have a Veterans Memorial. And on that memorial are 11,000 names. 11,000 West Virginians. Every one of them to be on that memorial must have given their life in combat. Any other death in any other way did not qualify to be added to the wall because that's the way the legislature did it. So we were a little selfish in thinking that our memorial in that cemetery, that is to pay tribute to the families of those 11,000 West Virginia. But thank God, people like Roy and others around over the country picked up on that. And as a result, there are now many communities. And there will be more and more because we are a caring people. And eventually, there are going to be Gold Star Family Memorial all over this land. It's long overdue. Past this. And that's another miracle. Thank you for your attention. so there wouldn't be any questions yeah. afterwards.
we had a big poster and picture contest here at Northport, and every middle school student did a poster or picture depicting Woody's con on Iwo Jima or depicting Woody or something that was patriotic to them. And we have two that were selected. And Woody, we want you to feel free to do, maybe you might want to put them in a hall at home, maybe you might want to put them someplace. Okay, guys. Mr. Brewer, get a big hand. He's the one to put this together again for us. And most of you know Mr. Brewer. He's been with us dozens, probably close to 100 times already. And uh, thanks so much for Northport. We appreciate you and all you do. Thank you very much. Um, Joey, got the timer on? Okay. Joey's going to time me. I uh, just want to thank Woody, Brent, Brian, and their families for the support and making this all happen, and uh, with the Gold Star Mothers, that's what they're about. That's what we're doing this for. And uh, <laughs> well, I want to thank the, the school, the principal, and you know, everybody involved in the school. Thank you very much. Um, I want to give some uh, thank yous to, also to the Florida Highway Patrol. St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office, Port St. Lucie PD, and the motorcycle crew, and our Blue Knights who have been part of this. I um, also have to thank the team that is working so hard to bring the Gold Star Family Memorial to you. And uh, some of them are here. Woody, I mean, uh, Woody, uh, Wally. Anyway, he's one of the, he's our, my cohort and all this. And uh, again, the staff, teachers, all your students, it's what you, it's for you. It is for you. And Lynn, you're also got where you at. Okay, Lynn, again, thank you so much. Um, I kept my promise. You're welcome. I love you guys. You know that. And before we have our final song by Mrs. Bailey of Acts, Mr. Trent, the will close us out today, and then we'll close with the song, How to Be American. Mr. Trent. Thank you, Mr. Rusty. To uh, all of our veterans that are here today on behalf of the school board and uh, to the Northport principal administration, the teachers, um, to Woody himself, you know, what, a, what an incredible, incredible story. And I'm so happy I was here today to see this. And whenever you can bring a, a bunch of middle schoolers in a room together for over an hour and a half and have their attention, that says something a lot. And so I want to commend these, these boys, these kids, these young people for listening. And I hope you go home tonight and you think a lot about what you heard today and you share that with your family and you share that with those in your community because it's the service of our veterans and folks like Woody that we're able to do this and have these activities in our schools. And so I just want to 
commend you and congratulate you and thank you for our service to our country and for being here today on behalf of our school board and all of the citizens here in St. Lucie County. Thank you so much.